good to get to be with all of you this morning. Uh, I see so many out, some are back from being out of town, some haven't been feeling well and are here. Uh, it's nice to get to be with you. I hope you had a good week. Uh, we got to go over to Dayton yesterday for their um, air show. I hadn't seen one of those since I was a kid. And we did get to pop over and park near the Columbus one this past week to see some of that. All due respect to the Thunderbirds, who are certainly doing something I can't do, but they ain't no Blue Angels. And we got to see the Blue Angels yesterday and, and watch some of that and just see what some of those things could do high, high above in the sky that God has made. And it was quite an incredible day. Um, because of that, uh, we, uh, we did an awful lot of walking. And if you see me just suddenly jerk out of nowhere, uh, I haven't become filled with the Spirit in some kind of unscriptural way. Uh, I've had a muscle spasm, and my apologies for that. We walked quite a few miles, and also got a lot of sun. And despite applying multiple times 100 SPF, uh, my Irish heritage just, uh, just uh, it, it bore its expected fruit. So I don't normally wear a polo on Sunday mornings. You haven't asked a dress code of me. The Bible doesn't either. But I generally like to wear a tie on Sunday mornings. But I have sensitive skin, so I'm going to wear this. And if you're wondering why. Crystal's practically a new ethnicity this morning. It's because she's allergic to a uh, sunblock and just had to sit out there in it. Native American heritage or not, she burned something fierce. So it's good to be with you. We had a good week. I hope you all did too. And I'm excited to get to uh, study the Bible with you today. To do so, I thought we would get started this morning just with, by uh, posing a very simple question. And that question is just, why do I try to do what is right? Why do I try to do what's right? When I ask myself that question, uh, I wonder if probably one of the most obvious reasons why any of us try to live right is because we want to go to heaven. I want to go to heaven. Uh, I don't know how many of you have had the privilege of, of hearing D. Bowman speak when he was alive. He was constantly throwing into his sermons somewhere the expression that if you've missed heaven, you've missed it all. Uh, and I think that certainly stands at the head of, of many lists. Why do I try to follow God's will? Why do I trust in the Lord? Why do I do the things that the Bible says? The answer is because I want to go to heaven. It is, of course, also true conversely that I do those things because I fear going to hell. I don't want to go there. I also do what is right because I, I believe that is right. I believe that's truth. That's the way I ought to live. I imagine that I, I do what is right, or try to, in part because I think it will give me self-respect. I believe something is true and right, and yet I, I don't live that way, well, then I'm going to feel guilty about that. I'm not going to feel very good about myself. So in terms of self-respect, um, and then also happiness. Uh, and in this case, I mean even true and lasting happiness, but, but also even just, just happiness throughout the day. I want to do what is right. And I may sometimes reach outside of myself and, and determine that I'm going to live right so that I can provide for others an, an encouraging example. And show my boys how they ought to live. But in considering those things, you may notice a lot of them focus on a benefit to me in doing what is good and right, in doing what God has commanded. Um, and I want to talk about that a little bit more in just a moment. That's not to say that, that that's a fault of those things. It's not. Um, neither is it a fault necessarily of our, our prayers and worship, when you may notice that sometimes they can, can focus on, on what benefit there is to us, what I get out of, of different kinds of things. Um, you might think of some of the songs that we sing. Many of them are focused on, on us as individuals uh, versus God and His glory. Certainly not all of them. Um, and we talk about sometimes hymns of worship. And they may spend a great deal of time kind of focusing on us. Now it's what God does for us and our love for God. Sometimes they can, they can come back to, to me a, a fair bit. Not that that is necessarily... A bad thing. Um, I was looking at the songs that we sang this morning. There's a pretty good mixture of the focuses throughout those songs. Um, 
when you're thinking about a night with Evan Pinion, you're thinking about what Jesus did there in the garden and all of his suffering. Um, or you think about the one that we sang just before this lesson. Uh, uh, one day I'll, I'll get to live in glory. I'd like to stay here longer than man's lot of days. And I'd like to have a longer life, but one day I'll get to be there with God. I'll get to be there with my Redeemer. Maybe you could say, well, that one's kind of, you know, well, I, I, I'd like this, but I'd rather have that. And I, but there's a great deal of, of, of godly, biblical teaching in that kind of song, of getting to, to be in glory with the Father one day, and that being a, a hope that we have. But then there's a difference, isn't there, between that kind of a song and, and for example, uh, there's one we've been singing over at Park Road called Behold Our God, and it's just all about Him. Who has held the oceans in His hand? Who has numbered every grain of sand? Behold our God and how great that He is. And you might thumb through our songbook any time and just notice how many of the songs have I in the title. And that doesn't mean they're necessarily bad. I just want to think about it for a minute. How many of them that deal with our needs and our feelings and our fears and our hopes and our salvation and our home in heaven, um, depending upon what songbook you look through, there may or may not be a lot of songs that simply focus upon God, His majesty, His holiness, His glory. Never mind me for a minute and just focus on Him. And the point is, is not to say that those things are in and of themselves inherently wrong. They aren't. Certainly I should want to go to heaven. I should want to be saved. I should sing of, of the hope that I have in, in God's promises. Me. I think that was the second to last song that we sang was the promise that God has, has made to us to, to watch out for us and care for us. Um, I will not forget that. That's what he's promised. So it's certainly true that, that when we sing to God, a part of our praise to him is thankfulness for his blessings. A lot of the songs that we sing are about our needs and, and, and feelings stated explicitly or implicitly that God is the source of our comfort and our healing. He's the, we have dependence upon him. There are a lot of psalms that proclaim dependence upon God, asking him to provide things like we sing about in our hymns. So my point is to say those kinds of songs are wrong. But what I do want to say is that, that I think it's easy to see as the ultimate goal of, of faith and faithfulness being salvation. That, that's the goal that living right is aimed at, my salvation. I, I want to suggest to you that, that in Scripture there's another picture. It isn't, of course, that the Bible doesn't hold out salvation as the goal of our journey. It is a goal of our journey. 1 Peter 1, verses 3 through 5. Peter says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So that, that is his opening to this letter as he's talking about the blessedness of God who through, through the resurrection of Jesus has prepared us for the salvation of our souls, and, and, and that we await. In verse 9, he says, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So he says, that, that's an end that is in view. That's the goal. And there are a lot of other passages that say similar things. The point I want to come back to is that at times, the Bible points us to an even higher goal. And that's what I want us to focus on for a few moments. You might say, well, what can be higher than that? What is more important than being saved in Him? What's more important than going to heaven when we die? How could there possibly be a higher goal than the salvation of our souls? Isn't that what Peter's just said, that the outcome of your faith is salvation? There are times when the Bible calls us to aim still higher. In Ephesians 1 and verse 3, in, in Ephesians he starts out much the same way as Peter did. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That same expression of the blessedness of God for the, the preparation of the plan of salvation that he brought through Jesus. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. 
even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. So a lot about the salvation that we get to enjoy because of what he's done. But notice now verse 6. To the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. The goal that Paul points to here is the praise of God's glory. Look in verse 7. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished upon us. And he goes on to talk about blessings that we have in Christ. You come to verse 11. In Him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of His glory. And that same thing continues. In Him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance, until we acquire possession of it, and that to the praise of His glory. So in these verses, Paul is, is certainly focusing upon our salvation and saying that when we are saved, we are receiving, we are, the benefits of the death of Christ, the forgiveness of our sins. We're receiving these, these incredible blessings, all spiritual blessings that God has, has just richly lavished upon us. So he's not ignoring that part by any means. But even then, when we are saved, all of this is ultimately to the praise of God's glory. When I think about why I, I want to do what's right and how I want to go to heaven and want to do the things that are right and things that are, are, are proper and, and trustworthy and, and why I want to be saved, I, I, will, I don't know if, if my focus is often enough on this ultimate goal. There are plenty of, of, of good reasons to, to want to do what's right and plenty of biblical reasons, but those reasons aren't enough, don't, don't reach to the end of the matter. There is a higher goal than going to heaven even, and that is glorifying God. So you will find the same thing in the Old Testament. If you want to know what value does the Old Testament have today, um, it's because if you want to foster intense devotion that looks beyond self, that's where it'll start. In uh, Psalm 25 and verse 11, for example, Psalm 25, David there is pleading for forgiveness. Well, why, why do I want to be forgiven? I can't go to heaven in my sins. In my sin, I can't have a right relationship with God. What hope do I have if I'm in my sins? So if I'm going to say to God why I need to be forgiven, well, it is because I need it. I am lost without it. But notice, David doesn't say any of that here. In verse 11, David says, for your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. For your name's sake. For your name. Even when God forgives me, it, it most certainly benefits me. And David talks about those things too in Psalm 25. But more importantly, it magnifies God. More importantly. It gives God the glory. And you can find that over and over again in the Psalms. Uh, more often than not, the Psalmists, they don't say, forgive me so that I can be saved. They say, forgive me so it will reflect your glory. In Psalm 31, in verse 3, David has been pleading to God for him to, to lead him and direct his steps. And he says in verse 3, For you are my rock and my fortress, and for your name's sake you lead me and guide me. 
And we often ask, and appropriately so, for God to guide us because we're weak, or as David's going to say in just a few verses, we're wasting away. There are many Bible passages that underscore that idea, but here the request is for your name's sake. You lead me and you guide me. So that others can see God's glory. It's His name that is glorified when I lead a godly life. In uh, Psalm 79 and verse 9, Asaph says, Help us, O God of our salvation, for the glory of your name. Deliver us and atone for our sins for your name's sake. Why should the nation say, Where is their God? So he's saying, Father, do these things so that the nations will know you are God. To the glory of God. Well, how do I, how do I glorify God? I suppose we might think just directly of, of praise. You know, sing songs of praise. Offer praise to God. Some of you may have sung before the, the song just entitled Glory. It's all about giving God glory. We, we give praise to God in our prayers. We credit uh, God in our conversation with our children, with our friends, even to ourselves. We're mindful of the fact that all our blessings come from God. I would offer to you a, a key passage in this subject when it comes to how we would glorify God, being 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 31. Um, in 1 Corinthians 10, as you're turning there if you like, I want you to remember another passage that might be a little bit more familiar to us. Uh, Colossians 3 and verse 17, Paul says, Whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. So we recognize first as God's children, we ought to do whatever it is that we do in the name of the Lord. We often take that to emphasize doing things by the Lord's authority, and that's fine too. But there really is more to it here. There's, there's more that's in keeping with the text of Colossians 3. And that is that whatever you do, you do it in His name. But notice the, the passage that is 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 31. Not only do we do everything in the name of the Lord, but in 1 Corinthians 10, Paul says, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. To the glory of God. In this context, Paul's addressing a controversy there in Corinth over eating and drinking food that's been sacrificed to idols and then therefore carried some religious significance to some. And Paul says... But regardless, remember that whatever you do, the ultimate goal is that God be glorified. And I can catch myself not thinking about that enough. That, that my days, my life ought to be to God's praise and glory. It's, it's easy to get distracted. It is very easy to get distracted and to put a great deal of focus on me. And that might not even be on like the benefit of God's blessings to me, but also on just what I'm going through, what's on my mind, what am I enduring, and, and forgetting about that greater goal of, of, of God's glory, which it's not as if I'm not allowed to think about those things that I'm enduring and not to feel bad about that. There are a great deal of psalms that are pleading with God to help the psalmist through something. And those are there, so we'll follow their example. But even then, God's glory is what's the ultimate goal. And even my own salvation is so that God can be shown to be the merciful, great God that He is to bring about such a salvation. In uh, Philippians 1, in verse 20, Paul is talking about his hope and his expectation that through the prayers of the Philippians, he would remain faithful and he would proclaim the gospel with, with the courage that he ought and and that he wouldn't be ashamed. And he says, It is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by my life or by death. So Paul certainly is concerned with his own salvation. Just a couple of verses earlier, Paul said, I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, for my salvation. And again, it isn't that we ought to be ashamed of, of saying why we want to be saved and, and, and why we want to do what's right. And it's because we want to go to heaven and we don't want to be lost and we want to do the things that are good. But, but I do need to realize that in some way that that's almost a, a concession if that seems to be my dominant goal. 
There's a greater one. And it has to do with the greater one. And that is to glorify Him. So I ought to long to do what's right for a variety of reasons, but chief among those is that it honors the God you adore. And that's what Paul says. Whatever it is that happens to me, whether it's life or death, I just want my life to work out to his honor. That kind of mentality turns the focus away from me and toward God. And it takes being truly able to say that you love God and are unquestionably devoted to him It is easy to be thankful to God and have that, or to have that thankfulness to God in mind, but not have that deep personal love for Him that causes you to desire that whatever happens to you, whatever you, you do in life, all of that works out towards His glory. That that's the goal that drives you. To where I can even get to the point that I see my own salvation, as to put it in other terms, as something that makes God look good, that gives glory to Him. That's the point I want to get to. So how is it that we glorify God? Well, uh, as we've just been saying, to obey Christ is to glorify God. Christ Himself said that His obedience to His Father glorified His Father. Every parent knows how obedient children reflect well on their parents. And when we obey the Lord, that glorifies God. When, when people around us see us calling God our Father and submitting to Him and obeying Him, that challenges them to, to transform from, from the, the weak and rebellious people that we can sometimes be into those who obey and honor Him. Every time we obey God, it glorifies Him. Because those who... Um, happen to be a witness to that godly behavior are, are pointed towards Him. If we suffer as a child of God, that glorifies Him. Christ, again, His own suffering was described as His manner of glorifying God. In uh, John 21 and verse 19, this He said, to show by what kind of death He was to glorify God. Peter says in 1 Peter 4 and verse 16, If anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. So when we suffer as God's children, when we suffer as Christ's people, when we do what selfish man does not want to do, and we do it out of faithfulness to God, that presents His glory to whoever may be watching. To live a pure life as a Christian glorifies God. We touched on this a little bit in Thessalonians this morning. Um, over in 1 Corinthians 6, you've got this context that's dealing specifically with sexual immorality. Paul says, you were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Um, every time you make the right choice with regards to sexual purity, for a world that says, who cares? You glorify God and show His power over your life. He is far more important to you than doing what the world does, even doing what you may want to do. He's more important. That glorifies God before that watching critical world. To go again to uh, 1 Peter, Peter says in chapter 2 and verse 20, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, not so that, that, that you will be honored, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God. Along with that, uh, to, to simply just do what is right and make the hard choices to follow God uh, and what God says is right. When perhaps it, it doesn't look like it will pay off in terms of this world, that glorifies God. That's what it means to, to walk by faith in the familiar passage in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 7. We walk by faith, not by sight. That, that means that what we do may look foolish to the world, but we trust God who's told us that that's what we ought to do. Uh, Romans 4 and verse 20 presents Abraham 
to us as an example of this. He's described as one for whom no unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. So when Abraham is, is acting by faith in the promises of God, and he packs up everything that he owns, and he leaves everything he previously, previously knew, that sort of thing looks pretty foolish to a lot of folks. That kind of faith that says, this too I will sacrifice if it's what God wishes, seems kind of foolish to some. Sometimes even to those who would profess, well, yeah, I want to go ahead. But it glorifies God. You might even add that to repent of sin glorifies God. Again, in, in selfishness and stubbornness, we, 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 would, we would repent, we would insist on our own way and, and press on. But when we're in our sin, we need God's help. And, and repentance then isn't just something we do, but it's something that God enables us to do. When we repent, it reflects the glory and the power of God. Paul says in Romans 2 and verse 4, Do you show contempt for the riches of His kindness, tolerance, and patience? Not realizing that God's kindness is meant to lead you toward repentance. So for us to repent when the world says, just enjoy what you want of this earthly life. Quit worrying about it. Quit being so critical. But to repent before God in light of His great glory and kindness glorifies Him. It also glorifies God to forgive someone who sinned against us. Remember, we forgive because we've been forgiven so much. We do that good because of what He has done. And that puts the focus on Christ and gives the glory to God. You could really kind of keep at this all day. We talk about how worshiping in, in harmony together is to glorify God. Uh, how teaching someone the gospel glorifies God. Um, Jesus says in John 15 and verse 8, By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit. Uh, to use whatever abilities that God has given us to serve Him and to serve others in His name glorifies Him. Peter says in 1 Peter 4, As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies. In order that in everything, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To Him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. But ultimately, I'd say everything that we do, whether we want it to or not, is going to reflect on God and on Christ whose name we wear. So if you say, I'm a child of God, say, I'm a Christian, then everybody interprets everything you do as reflecting in some way on the one who you say is your Lord. And that will either be for good or for bad. Which is an enormous challenge. I don't want to minimize the importance of making our eternal salvation a goal that drives us. But I do want to say that we need to recognize there is a goal that's even higher. And that's just logical, honestly, isn't it? My, I, I want to be saved. That is the most important personal thing to me. But, but I'm not the main character. God is. So anything of great benefit to me can't be the most important thing. It's what is of benefit to the greatest one that must be the most important thing. So the, the ultimate step of it is not self that's most important. It's my Father who loved me, who gave His Son to die for me. But he is the point that my life and my love ought to focus on and, and where the ultimate glory must go. So we're going to sing a, an invitation song here in just a second, like we always do at the end of our lessons. But if it is that you're not a child of God, the ultimate glory that, that you can ascribe to God this morning is to come and bow before Him and confess the name of His anointed Son and repent of your sins before Him and let Him wash them away as you're baptized into Him. That'll bring you 
enormous joy. It will bring you the hope of heaven, an eternal kind of hope. It will bring you a tremendous amount of, of happiness and fulfillment and self-respect and, and all of those good things. But it will also be to the glory of God for everyone who sees you. Bend your life to His will. And those of us here who get to see that will praise God for what is being done in you. And then all of those who know you and, and witness the new purpose for which you live, that you live for God, will see the power of God at work in your life. All of those things being to His glory. <laughs> So this morning, if you need to act in such a way as to glorify Him, be that by repenting of sin that you're uh, getting caught up in as a Christian and not living in a way that, that is in His name, or if you need to come and, and, and bend the knee to the King and, and, and pronounce your faith in God and, and dedicate your life to His glory by becoming a Christian this morning, how are we to help you? Let us There's a great day coming, a great day.